I'm here today with Rom Whittaker at the Madras Crocodile Bank Trust. So Rom founded the Madras Crocodile Bank Trust many years ago and the Snake Park. He is known as the original snake man of India. He has helped train a whole generation of herpetologists who all look up to him. And today we're going to be talking to him about how he started off and his entire journey. Fascinating journey so far. Great to see you here. Come, let's see some crocodiles. Mm. You grew up in the US in your early years as a child. Mm -hmm. And I think when you were about four or five, you started getting interested in snakes. I did, I did. How does that happen? How does a child who is growing, in, grow, growing up in New York get interested in snakes? Well, very luckily, my single mother mm -hmm. took my sister and I to a place called Husik, which is in northern New York State. I was born in the city, yes, I'm a New Yorker. But uh, when I was about three or four, we went, went up to the country. And interestingly, I, I was already a kid who was interested in all sorts of creepy crawlies. I was catching bugs, looking at butterflies, getting stung by bees occasionally. You know, the usual thing kids get involved in. Well, not usual, but one thing I did find very early on, I turned over a rock and I found a little snake. I brought it home and my mother was very, very different from most mothers. She actually said, wow, it's beautiful. OK, there's a secret there, because she knew that there are no venomous snakes there. And even if this little snake would have bitten me, nothing was going to happen. So this is the difference. But I do believe that every child has a fascination for little creatures. And all it takes is a negative word from a parent or someone they respect to turn that interest off. Well, mine was turned on high volume. The rest yeah, is and then you amped it up, <laughs> didn't you? I mean, you were Absolutely. you were roaming around with with snakes on local trains and scaring people off at people's homes with <laughs> with pythons. So well, why I, didn't you tell us a few of those uh, well, stories growing up? One of my favorite memories is uh, once when I I had to bring two king cobras back from Agumbe, from Agumbe in Karnataka, and I was wondering, okay, now I'm not going to have I, I qu can't tell anybody on the train. We're on a third class sleeper train. Uh, back to uh, Chennai, Madras in those days. So I, I did the obvious thing. I packed them in the usual bags that snakes are kept in inside a, veg a vegetable basket. And I covered it with a gunny sack and shoved it under the seat and there I just sat. And everyone thought, what a weirdo, this guy carrying vegetables from Karnataka. A white man yeah, carrying, carrying, carrying a vegetable basket. <laughs> Luckily, nobody asked me any questions. I said, can I see the vegetables? <laughs> but I remember I was on the, it was a third class sleeper and I was up on the top sleeper and uh, something woke me up later in the night and I looked down and one of the King Cobras, the biggest one, the 12 footer, had its head, although it was still in the bag, it had its head went underneath the gunny sacking and came out about two feet sticking out like that and was obviously trying to get out of the bag. Couldn't, of course. But then I saw a little kid had woken up and his eyes were as big as saucers and he was staring at this thing. And then he looked up at me and he saw that I was asleep. I mean, that I w had woken up. I had been asleep. And I put my fingers to my lips and he didn't quite understand. So I came down and I told him, Naikuti, a little baby dog. Uh, <laughs> Well, he believed me because I touched the snake on the tip of the snout well, through the bag and jook, its head went back inside and everything was okay. I tied it up nice and tight, pushed it under and I said goodnight to the kid. We went up. I went, he went to sleep. I went to sleep. Everything was okay. <laughs> but it could have been bad. So after growing up in India, you did eventually move back to the U.S. Yeah, I finished. I did my entire schooling in India up in Kodikanau mm -hmm. and I went back to the States to do what people are supposed to do and that is go to college. Mm -hmm. I actually managed a whole year in college but I was living in a state called Wyoming yeah. which was fishing and hunting paradise mm -hmm. so the more time I spent out in the field meant that the less study the less time on studies and I flunked out pretty badly but I wasn't meant for academics anyway and then I landed a job with um, a guy who is really my hero my guru my god I could almost call him his name was Bill Haast and he ran something called the Miami Serpentarium down in Florida. 
and I got a job there and uh, I worked for him for two years learning everything I could and probably sowing the seed in my brain of setting up India's first snake park. I'm sure it started then, but I don't honestly remember thinking about it then. But uh, then I got drafted into the U.S. Army because the Vietnam conflict was going on. I was a war protester, but they said, boy, you got two years in the Army or three years in prison. Make your choice. Well, there wasn't much choice. I did my two years in the Army, but they taught me uh, well, I trained as a medical lab technician. They sent me to Japan. So actually, it was quite a nice experience. After which you came back to India, is it? I came back to India in 1967. Mm -hmm. Then you know, hatched the idea of setting up a snake yeah. park. And uh, actually set up a small venom production lab in a place called Gaimuk Bandar, just on the Gaud Bandar Road outside of Bombay. And uh, while I was uh, uh, collecting snakes around the country, I came down to Tamil Nadu, right down here. And I met this group of people called the Irlas. The Irlas are some of the most incredible snake hunters you can imagine. They are the best snake hunters in the world, there's no doubt about it. They look at a track on the ground and say, there, a cobra just went there a few hours ago. Now we'll look around and find a rat hole where the cobra's gone in and they'll catch it. Unfortunately, they're catching them for the skin industry, so they're killing hundreds of thousands of snakes. And this was a no-no. This, this was really totally unsustainable. And the, uh, the Wildlife Protection Act came out around that time in the mid-70s. And that's when uh, the whole snakeskin industry was closed. But that meant the Urlas were in for a very hard time because they had, uh, well, no other occupation. They were snake hunting specialists. So we hatched an idea, and that is to start a snake catcher's cooperative and uh, let them catch, continue catching snakes, but just to extract the venom and then release the snakes back to the wild. Okay. It not only worked, this was 1978, okay? We're talking yeah. many years ago. Yeah. But it not only worked, it's worked to this day. The Irla Snake Catchers Cooperative now supplies almost all the venom used to make antivenom, which of course saves tens of thousands of lives every year in India. So do they know they are really instrumental in this kind of uh, life-saving exercise? Are they I, aware of I, it? I keep trying to get the Irlas to understand how important their work is. I'm sure to some degree they are, but I don't think they're fully aware that they're literally saving tens of thousands of lives, which is very true. I mean, antivenom is made by immunizing horses with small amounts of venom yep. and against the very dangerous snakes in India. And uh, so it's, it's vital, absolutely vital. So the supply of venom is so, so important. And I don't know, I, most people don't realize that as many as 50 or 60,000 people die of snake bite every year in India, almost all farmers. And uh, it's an incredibly big problem. And you've done a lot of work in the mitigation of uh, snake and human conflict. Yep. Why don't you take us through some of the work that you've done and you know, what are the kind of recommendations that you send out to people you meet? And for example, you know, how do they uh, address an issue of you know, uh, a snake that comes into their house when they're sleeping? And, you know, mm. uh, Little, little practical uh, difficulties like that. Yeah, they're little. Uh, yeah, well, not so little. <laughs> there are difficulties. Well, for one thing, snakes are very common in India and in rural India, particularly because there are just so many rats around. Yeah. And rice fields and wheat fields, almost any grain field is a natural magnet for large numbers of rodents. And rodents come into people's houses. And snakes follow the scent trail of rodents into people's houses. If a crate comes into somebody's house, it's a nocturnal snake, one of the very venomous snakes in India. If it comes into somebody's house in search of a rat and it happens to crawl over somebody, that person might try to whack it away and it'll, he'll get bitten. And he or she could die from that bite because the crate venom is very, very toxic. The whole snake bite mitigation program is based on the fact that if we can prevent snake bite, it's much better than trying to cure it. Because curing snake bite means getting to the hospital in time getting the antivenom, making sure all of the other complications of snake bite are dealt with, and they are complicated sometimes. So it's really much better to teach people, use a light at night, watch where you put your hands and feet, and don't get bitten. Use mosquito nets as well, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Particularly for someone sleeping at night. Using a mosquito net only protects you from mosquitoes and dengue and malaria. It can protect you against scorpion sting or snake bite. I always think that 
some big company producing mosquito nets is going to say, yes, we'll do it, and start distributing 100 million mosquito nets all around rural India. That would really help a yes, lot. Yes, as part of CSR or something like that, that should be great. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And for a herpetologist, I mean, who works so much with snakes, you're allergic to antivenom. How does that, how does that even work? And well, you have been bitten multiple times. Well, yeah, let's which not. Which you're not very proud of. Please don't remind me. Which you're not very proud of. No, I always say that if someone gets bitten by a snake, it's because of their clumsiness, stupidity, or a bad accident. Possibly, uh, thirty percent of of the, of the world's population is actually allergic to horse serum, from which the antivenom is made, and uh, some people are hypersensitive, and that's me, because I had antivenom earlier, and I, I became hypersensitive to uh, to uh, antivenom. So antivenom could kill me much faster than a snake bite unless I have an injection of adrenaline quickly enough. But by and large, antivenom, uh, it is the only cure for snake bite. I keep repeating the message that when a snake injects venom into you, you've got to get an injection to counteract it. You've got to, and you've got to get it fast. So when someone gets bitten by a snake, they say, what do we do? Go to the hospital as fast as you can. But there's no ambulance here, but there's a motorbike. Just make sure someone sits behind you to hold you on in case you start feeling dizzy or something. So all these are educational tools which we're now spreading around the whole country and making short videos about it too. கடிச்சதுனா <laughs> and the point is you're also making this information as accessible as possible, which is what is uh, yeah. really needed. And at the same time saying that snakes are a really important part of the ecosystem, because yeah. some yeah. people say, why don't we just wipe them all out? Number one, it's impossible. Yeah. Number two, they are extremely important. Yeah. They're the ones controlling most of the rats, yeah. which are eating most of our rice and wheat out there. We went and interviewed about a dozen people who were bitten by Russell's yeah. vipers in Kerala, and we asked them, so how did it happen? Every one of them said, because I was walking without a light. One guy, who actually had his leg amputated very sadly, said that I was walking out again every night for the last 20 years to turn the switch of my pump on for the rice field because at night the power is much higher. Every night I go out, it's the same path if I go. But I didn't use the light that night or the batteries were gone and I didn't have new batteries. Anyway, I'm going. So he got bitten. Do and you always practice what you preach? No, this is a really good question because I, I did walk out one of these nights and I, just here actually, not far, our house used to be here. And I heard the dog barking at night and I said, bloody dog, I'm going to go out and shut him up. So I dressed, put on my lungi and barefoot of course, and never mind all that. Torch, i leave the torch, I was just going to see where the dog is. One, two, three steps and the third step was onto something round, firm, and a bit rough, and then I heard this massive hiss, like a pressure cooker coming straight up at me. And man, I, just like the old cartoons when you sort of tread air, I was treading air and got back on the porch, got a flashlight, came out, there was a big Russell's Viper there. I was just so lucky it didn't bite me. Growing up, you were quite the hippie, weren't you? I mean, you had a, uh, and a stud. You used to have a sand boa coiled around your hair. I mean, uh, what, what, how? Well, that, that's kind of a, a semi-myth. No, it's actually true. Uh, yeah, I had a, a, a bit of a wilder head of hair and a lot more hair in those days. Uh, but <laughs> I, yeah, sandboard just finds it very natural to sort of tangle itself up and stay there. And I drive my motorcycle down Mount Road in Madras and one day a cop stopped me 
and I may have been going a little bit too fast, but I think he was more interested in seeing this weird hippie looking character on a bike. He didn't see the snake then, but when I got up and talked to him, uh, he said, you are going fast. And I said, yeah, but normal speed. He said, mm, like that. Then he saw the snake in my head. He says, what is that? And I said, it's a sandboy. No, no venom, it's okay. You can touch it if you want. No, 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 thank you, thank you. Go, go, go. So I took off. That was a nice interaction with a policeman. But you know, handling uh, snakes has always had this very macho, you know, India Jones-esque, you know, sort of yeah. Uh, yeah. vibe to it. Do you sort of, in a way, think that in the early years you may have also sort of contributed to that, uh, to that whole? No, it's true. Uh, it's, it's idea. Some of the earlier snake films that we did, uh, definitely, I came on as the sort of hero, able to handle snakes when no one else could, and that kind of stuff. Very boring. Now. Then, of course, it was very exciting and your ego is full of yourself. But this is the kind of lesson we've got to get through to these kids who are up-and-coming snake naturalists. But the, with, with the advent of, uh, advent of uh, social media, Facebook in particular, uh, they all want their photos doing something absolutely nuts with snakes. So whenever we give a, a lecture to a group of snake rescuers or people who are interested in snakes, we always say, so, do you like snakes? Yes, we love snakes. Okay, if you love snakes, do us a big favor, do them a big favor, don't get bitten. Don't do stupid things. Because it just, it, it's not helping the snake at all. It's very likely hurting the snake, and it could hurt you. You could get bitten and die. What will your family think? And the trouble is the snake always gets blamed, not the people. But it is a disservice. If they respect and love snakes, they should teach people to do the same. And not do stupid things like kissing a cobra or putting it around their neck or some nonsense like that. So, yeah, it's a tough job, <laughs> you know, encouraging everyone yeah. to, to work with animals to work like with this. Them and like them. But yeah. be it, do it sensibly and do it right, you know. The gharial are here, out basking in the sun. And uh, this is a breeding enclosure where we have one big male who's somewhere around, and uh, so about six or eight females, and they'll all start laying their eggs up on that sandbank. You can see this is kind of like a river stretch. The original design of this place was to make it look a little bit like a piece of the Chumbal River with beautiful sandbanks. So when you set up the, the snake park and later the croc bank, what were you really thinking at that time? What were your objectives back then? And how have they sort of evolved over the years now? Yeah, I, well, the first thing was pretty obvious that a, a snake park had to be set up in India because this is the land of snakes. We set up the snake park in the city and the first year we had 10 lakhs visitors. One million people came into the snake park that first year. So I said, okay, we've done something right here. People are very interested. There may be negative feelings towards snakes and all that, but nonetheless, they are a very popular animal. I had been uh, doing uh, surveys of crocodiles more or less throughout the country in the early 70s. And crocodiles were in really bad shape. All the three species, the saltwater croc, the mugger, and the gharial, were either literally on the verge of extinction or certainly heading to that direction. So I was in touch with uh, crocodile biologists and researchers in America and Africa. And they very kindly, it was all snail mail in those days, but they very kindly sent me reprints and uh, very answering all my stupid questions about how to incubate crocodile eggs and all that. And we realized that we could actually start breeding crocodiles in captivity and then releasing them back in the wild and restocking and bringing crocs back to safe numbers again. So, but we needed a space to do it in. And that's how the croc bank was born. And so you were in a way instrumental in the, uh, you know, bringing up of gharial numbers as well, uh, along with other people, of to course. To some extent. Yes. Yeah. The thing is, it, the government had to get on board for this. Yeah. And we were, of course, always chiving the government. We were always saying, look, crocodiles are really getting close to extinction. Let's do something about it. And at that time, under the prime ministership of Indira Gandhi, there was a lot of wildlife consciousness. In and thank God for that, because it was such a crucial time, the early 70s. And something called Project Crocodile was started by the government, which we contributed to as well. We started breeding them in captivity here. They started collecting eggs in the wild in Katranya Ghat on the Girwa River, on the Chambal River in UP and MP and Rajasthan. And they started incubating the eggs and releasing the babies back to the wild. You know, in those days, I counted, uh, I estimated there were about 200 gharial left in the wild. 200. 
I mean, that is literally on the verge, the edge of extinction. And now there are more than 3,000 of them in the, just in the Chumbul River, where most of the Garyos still live. Wow. And you know why? Because this is one of the last clean rivers we have left. Because it's called an unholy river. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's so ironic. The yeah. holy rivers of the Yamuna and the Ganga are yeah. absolute cesspools. Yeah, absolutely. In most of it. Yeah. There are some good stretches, yes, luckily. Mm. But the Chambal River is still a relatively keen, clean river. It's wonderful. Do you still breed uh, gharials here? Oh, yeah. The gharial are breeding here. In this enclosure, there's eight females and one male. And every year they make nests. And uh, the babies are usually given to zoos either given to them for rearing so that they have a display for educational purposes or in exchange for other animals. One of the interesting things about the croc bank is also that it has really been one of the places where a whole generation of you know, wildlife biologists and herpetologists have really uh, you know, come of age and then of course gone on to do great things on their mm. own. Mm. And they all really look up to you and are always saying wonderful things about you. <laughs> so was this also part of the larger vision when you really started off? Uh, in a way, I guess it must have been. The point was, at that time in my career, I, I had come to India, back to India in 67, and there was hardly anybody interested in reptiles. There were a few people at the Bombay Natural History Society and a few scattered individuals who then became my pals. But uh, snakes were just not on the list of popular animals. Birds, yes. Butterflies, yes. Tigers, oh yes. Snakes, crocodiles, lizards, turtles, no. Very difficult to find anyone interested. But I think what they needed was a place to come to, to number one, appreciate how beautiful the animals are. Number two, to maybe get a little bit of knowledge from what, whatever we were finding out and share our knowledge. And hiring them or getting them on board as volunteers so they could help us work on things and, and get excited by it. And, and maybe get obsessed by it, which is of course the main goal here. Yes. <laughs> so you must be having a great sort of repository of knowledge in a sense over here at the Madras Crocodile Bank Trust because so much of research must have happened over the years. No, you know? that's very true. That's probably what differs this zoo from any other zoo in India is that uh, we, we have research stations in the Andaman Islands. We have one in Karnataka, in Agumbe. We have a gharial research station on the Chambal River in UP. So uh, very few zoos have any sort of this outgoing uh, you know, field stations. And also, we've produced literally hundreds of uh, peer-reviewed research papers on the breeding of them in captivity, but also of their habits in the wild. All this adds up to helping the forest department, the wildlife authorities, do their management the plans yeah. and, and, and conserve these animals. Yeah. Zoos are always known to be fairly controversial, in, you know, and to be able to do this differently and, you know, and still be, you know, very steeped in conservation and create this whole, uh, you know, understanding of behavior through this, uh, through this establishment you've set up. I guess that's what makes it different from, you know, anything else we've had yeah. so far. And that's what really makes it, you know, unique in, in a sense. Well, I think so too. And I think the zoos that really shine in India are those that pay attention to just that and also to the enrichment of the animal's experience. Yeah. These are animals kept in captivity. Yes, they, it does serve a purpose. Children are absolutely fascinated by animals. Whenever they see them, they would never get to see most of these animals in the wild. So zoos have a very important function, but it has to be done right for the animals. Yeah. And enrichment is such a big part of it. Yeah. Letting the animals do stuff that they would do in the wild, for example. So how do you feel about crocodile breeding now, after all these years? <laughs> well, that's a kind of a controversial question because I worked in the country of Papua New Guinea for a couple of years, and my job there was uh, actually to help village people set up crocodile farms for, for the skins. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't really like killing reptiles because they're my favorite animals, but I really understood the, the reasoning behind this particular thing of sustainable use of wildlife. Because in the wild, it's very easy to wipe crocodiles out or to ruin their habitat. But these village people over there had no other source of income except for cutting trees down. Cutting trees down, yes, okay, to a certain extent is okay, but if their only livelihood is from cutting down trees, they're going to cut down all of them. Whereas if they harvested crocodiles, a surplus of the crocodiles, they could make money for their, in, in a village situation where they have no other industry or anything like that, and still uh, not hurt the population because you're only taking a small percentage of the crocodiles. 
Well, apply this to India and I'm afraid it doesn't work because we have a great uh, strong sympathy for animals and we don't want to kill animals and of course the laws are against it. But it is still a very viable opportunity, the sustainable use of wildlife. You know, you were also known as the original sort of snake man of India. I know how that came about, but how does that really make you feel? It's a little embarrassing sometimes because I get a lot of people coming up to me, selfies are selfie, <laughs> but well, that's okay. I'm very polite. You are a bit of a celebrity around well, here. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of hard to be a celebrity and about snakes. I mean, who, who imagined that they become so popular? So I guess in that sense, I got to be proud of it or at least happy about it because if I'm the spokesperson for snakes, it's great. I was never much of a person to do with anything like religion and so on, but in, in a way I'm kind of like a missionary, aren't I? Because I'm always talking about how wonderful snakes are, yeah. which is of course bringing me back to the snake bite thing. We've got to do something about snake bite. Yeah. <laughs> how do you get people to like them, you know? Yeah, I believe, I mean, snake bites are massively underreported in this country. Absolutely. Which is why I guess it is all the more important to do something about them. Absolutely. Well, you know what's interesting is uh, the government statistics showed that about 1,400 people are killed by snakes every year. And then, uh, earlier in this, uh, around 2005, 2006, something, uh, a study was done called the Million Death Study. And they used something very interesting called verbal autopsy. Have you ever heard of that? No, I haven't. Okay, basically it's two social workers and two doctors go to a million households in villages in, in India and find out what the causes of death were. They found out that snake bite statistics are way up over 50,000 deaths per year. Wow. And that's compared to the official government statistics of 1,400. Something's wrong somewhere, right? You've also sort of spoken about, you know, how important it is for children, for example, to be able to touch and feel these reptiles. That's a really important thing. When children come here, a group of school students come here, for example, we've got a guy doing a lecture and telling the kids about snakes and stuff like that. Uh, we used to be able to have a guy walk around with a snake around his neck and kids would come up and touch it. And when you see the look on their face after they've touched this, at first they say, no, no, I don't want to touch it. They touch it, they say, wow, it feels beautiful. It's so smooth and so dry and so clean. And we feel this is a really important part of a child's education to be able to touch a snake. Now, I know why they stopped doing it, and I know why it's illegal to do it in India, because people would misuse the whole idea of it and, and actually sort of semi-torture the snake and carry him around in the hot sun and stuff like that. But uh, an organization like the Croc Bank, with, a, with its credentials, should be given permission to allow kids to touch a snake. Uh, it just changes their lives on that, at that moment. So how many kinds of uh, crocodiles do you have here? We have 17 different species. There are 23 in the world, so we've still got a few to go. This was also one of the early objectives of the Croc Bank, to be able to have these species here for, oh, absolutely. you know, to be able to safeguard them in a sense. Well, that's why the Croc Bank is called a bank, bank. and not a croc farm or something like that, yeah. because it's a gene bank actually of crocs yeah. from around the world. So basically, if people want a pure strain of the mugger crocodile, or right now the Siamese crocodile, they come to the Croc Bank and together. ship one for them. Yeah. There's something very interesting, uh, you know, I've heard about uh, crocodile breeding, which is the whole temperature controlled uh, yeah. uh, idea. Were you also doing that here at some point? Well, we weren't at the beginning, but uh, then we found out about it and it just amazed us. The Must idea... Must have been fascinating finding out about it that, is. wasn't it? The fact that if you keep crocodile eggs uh, incubated at a higher temperature, you get all males, and at a lower temperature, you'll get all females. So this blew our minds and we... Got a guy on board by the name of Jeffrey Lang, who is uh, one of the world's top croc biologists. And he uh, actually started doing these uh, studies on the temperature sex determination, TSD for short. And uh, now we're doing it with Gariel and, uh, well, all the other species as well. I'm also curious to know what have been your learnings in all these years of running a place like this? I'm sure you've made mistakes and learned and, you know, would, would well, do things differently. Probably the most embarrassing one is that one day, one day one of our guys who were working here was walking around checking the enclosures early in the morning, about six in the morning when, after sunup. 
and he suddenly disappeared from view. He fell down into a hole on the outside of the enclosure. And we realized that uh, we hadn't made the foundation of the walls low, deep enough, and two of the crocs had dug a nice deep hole and gotten out and left that hole just uh, for this guy to fall into. Well, luckily, he saw the crocs before they got down to the ocean, which would have been a public relations disaster. And so we caught him, caught both the crocs and got them back again. But that's, like you said, a learning experience. So now all of our foundations are very, very deep. And if it looks like any croc is digging, we quickly put some rocks there and say, no digging. <laughs> and also running a place like this, I'm sure, is also a very emotional sort of experience because I'm sure you lose, you know, crocs and turtles, which you are sort of attached to. True. And, uh, you know, how do you, how do you cope with uh, something like that? Well, the biggest loss we've had was just very recently, not even a month ago, a croc that we nicknamed Jaws. Mm -hmm. He was a, the biggest saltwater crocodile in captivity in India. And uh, we originally got him from something called the Central Leather Research Institute here in Chennai. And the then director, Dr. Naidama, said that they, he, he said, we heard, that they had brought some crocs from Singapore, some saltwater crocs from a farm there, just little babies, and they were going to measure them every year to see how fast they grew so that when they slaughter them, they knew how much money they could make from the skin, which is what central leather research institutes do, I guess, yeah. to find out what the next profitable leather could be. Well, I had an idea, and I went to him, met him in his office. He was very kind, and he knew about the snake park, and he let me into his office to talk to him, even such a senior person. Mm -hmm. And I said, look, here's one idea we could do. We'll keep that crocodile for you. We'll rear it up, we'll feed it, and we'll measure it every year, and we'll measure it at the time when you think it's harvestable. You don't have to kill it, though, because we'll tell you how many inches of leather you're going to get out of it and how valuable it is. What do you think about that idea? And amazingly, he said, yes. He wow. said, you can have the crocs. So, I mean, for me, it was like one of those magnificent days to go out of the Central Leather Research Institute with this little crocodile, probably four feet long, under my arm. And uh, this thing grew like a champion with his champion genes and grew up to 17 or 18 feet, 500 kilograms wow. over the last 45, 50 years. And, uh, and he was a real character too. He, he became very tame. You could call him up and feed him. And he was quite okay in captivity. We got to know him so well that I don't know, it's, kind of hard to imagine shedding a tear for a crocodile because it's usually the other way, right? <laughs> yeah. But in this case, losing Jaws was a really very sad moment in our lives. Well, but you gave him a long and full life, something he wasn't going to have at that time. He, yeah? he had a wonderful life, yes. That I have to admit.